serving this amazing community, the communities that we serve in this amazing institution for the last 12 years as the CEO. It is really an honor to be here with you and to have you here. I want a special welcome to uh, not only the media and those that are on live stream. We're live streaming uh, this uh, conference and speech and uh, just thank all of you for being here too. Um, want to also a special, a special thank you to Spartan Nash. Uh, it's been a long relationship with Mary Freebed and we appreciate it very much. And so not only the ongoing support, but uh, the Our Family brand. It's uh, pretty exciting. I think everybody in the room's dream when they were a kid was to be on the cereal box that was sitting in front of them for the half an hour that they were eating cereal. <laughs> Back before cell phones, that's all we had to look at. So. <laughs> Um, we just did a real quick tour. It's probably the fastest tour I've ever been on. I'm frankly exhausted. Uh, Melissa's not breathing because she's a Paralympian and I'm not. So she handled it. Uh, she uh, just flew from Colorado Springs to Chicago and drove, over, drove herself over here to Mary Freebed and we are not giving her an opportunity to sit down. So you're going to be inspired by her story. Um, they, uh, there's going to be a book signing afterwards. So the Power Choice is Melissa's book, and uh, I'd love to get a signed copy, uh, but uh, she might be signing copies if you're nice enough to her, and a uh, chance to connect and say hello. Uh, so please uh, note that. We are going to unveil the cereal box, our family brand cereal box, right now. And this is the first time she has seen this. Oh, that is awesome. Now, in the back of the cereal box, you would find our very special uh, wheelchair and adaptive sports program highlighted on the back, and we want to thank Spartan Brands for that. We're so proud. One of the largest wheelchair and adaptive sports programs in the, in the country and uh, continues to grow under the leadership of Mar Maria Besta, and it's just uh, something that all of us just feel so good about being a part of. Uh, let's see. Um, Melissa, inspiring. Uh, so uh, she'll tell you her story. I'll just keep it to a few things. First Lieutenant in the Army was in Iraq. Uh, this is a combat wound. She lost her leg. She'll tell you about it. Um, she was the first Iraq uh, a war veteran in the Paralympics. I want to say Beijing, I think was 2008. Yeah. And has been in the Paralympics since. Uh, she, um, there's nothing that can get her down. I just asked her, I said, is it true you broke your back last year in a bike accident? And she said, yes. And, um, I watched, uh, an interview that you did and, um, essentially her response was, so what, we're going to get through it and, and go move on. So I can't wait for you to be inspired by her. I know I will be, oh, by the way, she's a prosthetist. And if things are a little slow in Colorado Springs, we always have our doors open for <laughs> wonderful prosthetists. So uh, without any more delay, I want you to welcome Melissa Stockwell. Oh, and I should, I really meant to say thank you for your service to oh, this country. Because, thank you. Because uh, we are all grateful. Thank you. I know there's other veterans out there as well. So thank you all. That is larger than life. Wow. Um, that's really cool. Um, I know. I can't wait to actually have that on my breakfast table and have my kids walk out and be like, wait a minute. Is that you, Mom? So I just did a tour. and This is the most incredible facility. Um, you'll hear my story in a minute, but I did a lot, a lot of my rehab at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And um, it was just this, it was, it, it was new and it, it wasn't new, but it was kind of the, the old hospital and it had a small physical therapy gym. To see this is nothing short of incredible. I mean, talk about the best of, of the best. So I'm going to share with all of you um, a little bit about my own story today. And kind of the hope is that when you leave here, you think about your own journey, like your own path in life. And the goal is that you reflect on it and you think about we all have the power of, of choice, no pun intended on the book, um, to, to go out and to truly live the life that you all want to live. 
So I like to say that I was born a, a patriot. Um, like many of you out there who may have served, I realized very early on in my life the, what the flag represented. I, I understood that, that we were very lucky to live in the country that we live in, the red, the white, and the blue. And I always thought that I wanted to give back. I wanted to give back to a country that I thought had given me so much. So as I grew up and I saw military personnel, they had like a flag patch on their shoulder. They were um, in the community, they were on TV. I always thought, that's what I wanna do. I wanna wear that uniform. So my story eventually led me out to, to the University of Colorado in Boulder, where I joined the Army ROTC program, which is basically a program that teaches you all about how to be a military officer. And I fell in love with it. I, immediately. The uniform I got to wear, the patch on my shoulder, I felt like I was, you know, giving something bigger than myself, part of a team, the camaraderie, the leadership I was able to learn. I truly fell in love with that uniform and what it stood for. And then in college, um, senior year happened and the date of September 11th of 2001 came up on the calendar. And as we all know, when those towers fell in New York, that truly changed, it changed the world. And it truly changed the trajectory of, of my own life. And I knew on that day that when I graduated a year later, I would most likely be deploying to some point over to a war. And the uniform that I was so proud to wear on American soil, I'd probably be wearing it on foreign soil as well at some point. But first, I, a year later, I, I graduated from college. I was commissioned as a second lieutenant into the United States Army with not come from a very from a military family, my very skept, once skeptical parents, but now very proud by my side as they set me off into the wide world of the Army. So I got deployed to Iraq about two years after this picture was taken, and we landed in Kuwait, and then we took the long road trip up into Iraq to what was gonna be a, the start of a year long tour over there as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And we had been in Iraq for about three short weeks when the fateful day of April 13th of 2004 came up on the calendar. And that day kind of started out like any other day over in Iraq, I woke up early, I put my uniform on, I put my flat, my bulletproof vest on, weapon in hand, had my Kevlar on, we had a briefing on the day's mission, and it was a mission like I had done multiple other times over in Iraq in the three weeks prior. The only difference on this particular day is instead of sitting next to the driver, I was sitting behind the driver. I, I, I honestly didn't really have, ha, have a job. I was kind of doing a ride along. I was going to learn the route because the next day I was going to take over and I was going to lead that route. So it was supposed to be a pretty easy day. But our vehicle, um, we left the gate, our forward operating base, which was just north of central Baghdad. And about 10 minutes into the ride, we went under this, this bridge, just like an underpass you would drive under and not really think about it. And there was just this, this deafening boom. I look up and there's black smoke everywhere, the smell of metal, the windshield is crashed in, our vehicle swerves, to the left, we ricochet off of a guardrail, we swerve back to the right, and we ultimately end up crashing into this woman, this Iraqi woman's house. And the whole time, the woman in the front is yelling, IED, IED, we've hit an IED, which we all knew meant a roadside bomb. Our vehicle crashed into this woman's house, and the other four soldiers in my vehicle did every, exactly what they were supposed to do. They got out of the vehicle, they surrounded it, they pointed their weapons out to assess the situation, to kind of think about what they should do next. So I started to do just that. I took my seatbelt off, I looked over, I looked down, and I knew pretty quickly that something wasn't right. There was a lot of blood. And I called out, I'm hurt, I'm hurt. Luckily for me, there was a combat lifesaver who was trained in first aid, a few vehicles back, and, and he heard me. He rushed up to my vehicle and he pulled me out of it and he laid me there on the sands of Iraq, um, delivering what I thought was first aid. I know now that it wasn't first aid, but he was actually um, saving my life. My leg was gone. It had been severed. And a few days later from the hospital room, seeing a picture of, of my Humvee um, with that windshield cracked in and the blood on the ground, which I knew was my own, and a picture that's once 
really hard to look at. But this many years later, I can look at that picture and think about the power of the human body, the power of the human spirit, and just how much we can overcome and how much we can adapt. But from that Baghdad emergency room, I, I had to move on. I had no choice. So um, I moved on physically first, and I went from there to through Launchville, Germany, and then back to Walter Reed Army Medical Center, which at the time in 2004 is pretty much where all the wounded soldiers went from Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was here where my parents met me, once a skeptical of their youngest daughter joining the military, and then the horror of a phone call that I had been severely wounded in a war. But now, strong and steadfast by my side, oftentimes reassuring each other that things were going to be okay. And when I was able to kind of, you know, come to and I'll kind of come down off the pain medication a little bit and come out of my hospital room, I looked around me and I saw other soldiers that were missing two limbs, three limbs. They had lost their eyesight. They had traumatic brain injuries. And if you've been to a military hospital or even some of the wards here, there is a lot of devastation, but there was so much resilience and choosing to focus on that resilience and realizing when I looked around that Sure, I lost a leg, but I was one of the lucky ones. I had three good limbs. I had my mind. I had my eyesight, not to mention my life, because too many continue to give and have given that ultimate sacrifice. And making a promise then to live my life for those who no longer could. I didn't want to let losing a leg stop me from doing anything that I wanted to do in my own life. Well, you can imagine it's, it's, it's tough, right? I was 24 years old, and in a second a leg is gone. I had no choice in the matter. When the surgeon first told me in that Baghdad emergency room that I no longer had my leg, I feel like I should have asked him was like, well, can you look again? Because it just seemed so surreal that it was just gone and I had no, no choice. So laying there in that hospital bed, wondering, you know, what would life be like? Would I ever walk? Would I run? Would I be independent? But the goal at that hospital, like it is here, honestly, is to regain your life back. And down in physical therapy, getting fit for my very first prosthetic leg, the series of castings and measurements, a similar ONP lab, like is here. And then they stand you up in the parallel bars after they do these casting, and they kind of make this piece that fits on your leg called, called the socket that kind of attaches to your leg. And they say, OK. And now you're going to walk. And I remember thinking, how on earth am I going to walk with this thing? Like, this isn't my leg. There's, it's metal. It's plastic. It's awkward to move. But I looked across the physical therapy gym, and I saw a man missing both of his legs and his arm. And what was he doing? He was walking. Perspective is truly everywhere. So I really had no choice. What do you do? Well, you walk. First in the parallel bars, and then crutches, and the cane. And then the day came where I walked all by myself. And I realized that my life would go on. The only difference is every day I'd wake up, I'd put my prosthetic leg on, I'd go about my day just like you guys do, and then I would take it off at night and then repeat it, it, it all the next day. But as soon as I learned to walk, I, I always wanted more. So as a, as a young girl, I was a gymnast, and I dreamed of going to the Olympic Games, and I'd, I'd kind of always been an athlete. So I would lay there in my hospital bed wondering, like, could I still ever be an, an athlete? feel the sweat on my face, a thrill of a finish line. So lucky for me at Walter Reed, there were all these organizations whose missions were to kind of come into our hospital room, get us out and get us out doing things that we never thought we'd do with both of our legs, much less with one. So I took every opportunity I could. And before I knew it, I was out in Colorado learning to ski on one leg after growing up skiing on both this whole new adventure of back on the bunny slope, falling everywhere, wobbly, but by the end of the week, up that chairlift, flying down the mountain, the wind in my face, and I had never felt so free. And going back to the hospital after this trip and thinking, if I can do that, I can really do anything. And it came at an amazing time because a week after I got back from this trip, someone came to the hospital to put a presentation on about the U.S. Paralympics. And I sat in a room, actually very similar to this one, as this gentleman with a, with a booming voice. And I felt like he was talking right to me. And he's like, if you train hard enough, if you dedicate yourself to a sport, then you can compete on the world's biggest athletic stage as somebody with a disability. 
And I sat there, jaw on the ground, as a young gymnast who had dreamt of the Olympic Games. Here I was being told that I kind of had a second chance. Not to mention I could wear a uniform and represent a country that I defended over in Iraq. And it was, I left that room knowing that somehow, some way, I wanted to be a Paralympian. But first I was medically retired from, from the military. But it was 2005 at the time, and I knew that there was going to be a 2008 Paralympic Games in Beijing. And I decided that I was going to give it a shot in the sport of, of swimming. So if any of you are swimmers out there, you might agree that, that swimming has this like healing effect. I would get in the water and kind of forget as though I didn't have a leg. No, I do not swim in circles, um, as I often get asked. But it, it was this, um, like this, this healing that I, I, I fell in love with the water and just like what, how it made me feel. And not to mention, I had a lot of room for improvement. The Paralympic Games, you don't just sign up and go. You have to beat your competitors. You have to make certain times. And my times were way up here. And they had to come way down here if I had any shot of making it. So I kind of put everything on hold to try to make this dream a reality. I moved out to the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, where I swam and I slept, or and I swam and I swam. And I was a total long shot to make the 2008 Beijing team, but I went to trials and had the meat of my life and ended up qualifying for the 2008 Beijing Paralympic team. And being able to put on that Team USA uniform, walk in opening ceremonies, and then swim in multiple events in the state-of-the-art water cube that they built just for the Olympic and Paralympic Games in Beijing. And having dreams of being on that podium and having that medal around my neck. And that didn't happen. Um, in Beijing, I had a pretty poor athletic performance. I didn't make finals. And at the end of this biggest competition of my life, I just kind of felt like I had let everybody down. My teammates, my country, my, my family, kind of everyone that had supported me. But I learned a pretty cool lesson at my first Paralympic Games because in, in life, you, all, you, want, you want the medals, right? You want the recognition. You want your hard work to pay off. But it's not always about the medals. It's about the journey to get there. It's about overcoming things that come your way that you, may, that you never expect, but persevering through them, and a lot of times even ending up better on the other side. And at the end of the Paralympic Games, there is a closing ceremonies, and an athlete is um, nominated by their peers on who's going to carry the American flag in and kind of represent their country. And when they decided that I was going to be that athlete um, to carry this American flag in, I, I realized that, that it's not always about the medals. It's about the heart you have to get through things that, that come your way. And carrying an object that I was so passionate about, sold out stadium, representing all of Team USA, it's one of those things you kind of wish you can go back and relive over and over again. So how do you beat that? You compete in the Paralympic Games, you carry the flag in. Well, I did what most people would do and went back home, went back to work in the field of prosthetics. So after I was um, discharged or retired from, from the military, I went back to school to get my degree in prosthetics, a field of work I didn't even know existed until I needed a leg of my own. But the true reward of getting somebody back up on their feet, showing them what they can do and having kind of a firsthand experience to help them through it. But once you're an athlete, you're, you're always an athlete. And after the Beijing Paralympic Games where I swam, someone, um, a group called the Challenge to Athletes Foundation, they're based out of California, and they called me and said, hey, you want to do a triathlon? I'm like, triathlon? What, like, what is that? Well, you swim, you bike, and you run, and you do it like all at the same time, all in the same day. Something I used to think only crazy people would do. But I thought, you know what? I'm going to give this a shot. Kind of always been up for a challenge. So in 2009, I flew out to my very first triathlon, and I swam, I biked. I ran, came across the finish line, and I was, I was hooked. I loved the challenge of all three sports, the challenge of the different prosthetic legs I had to wear. And, you know, before the bike and the run, you're taking one leg off, you're putting one leg on, and there's literally, like, legs and shoes everywhere, and you're not sure what's happening. But I loved it. I loved the variety of it. And it turns out I wasn't so bad at it and was able to compete around the nation, around the world. And I'm actually still, still doing that today. And that joy of carrying that flag overhead towards that finish line just, just never gets old. So it's been, a, it's been a wild ride, as you can imagine. And every year on April 13th, instead of mourning 
the loss of a leg and what happened over in Iraq, we actually celebrate, as kind of cheesy as it sounds. But I named what's left of my leg Little Leg. It's a leg bit short, so it seemed natural to name it Little Leg. And every year on April 13th, we actually have a birthday party for a little leg. <laughs> Family and friends fly in. That may or may not be my dad and I dancing on a bar. We may or may not have a few drinks out of my leg. But it's become this event that is um, honestly means more than my, than, than my birthday because this is truly my alive day. This is the day that I got to continue living this incredible life that, that I've chosen to live now. So... And it's a day to really reflect, to reflect on life and truly how good we have it. A lot of times we get so caught up in the negative parts of, of our days, we turn on the news and there's just so much negativity, but there's so much good in the world and there is so much positivity. And I encourage all of you to, to seek it out and to find it. And when you go to bed at night, think about the good things, not not the bad things that went on in your day, because I can promise you there is good. But reflecting back on the past couple years and just realizing the incredible experiences that I've had, been able to share a dance with the president, um, a laugh with the first lady, give a fist bump to Tom Brokaw, <laughs> and I've had some pretty cool moments that I never would have had without Little Leg. But what I'm most proud of, at, really out of everything that I've done, is, is giving back. Because I wouldn't be here if it weren't for people or organizations that have kind of paved the way and shown me what is possible. So back in Chicago, co-founding a group called Dare to Try, where we get athletes with physical disabilities into the sport of triathlon. And our Family Foods had, and Spartan Nash has taken an interest and, and has sponsored some of our camps as well. So just being affiliated with, with an organization that cares about their community. But getting these athletes, proving to them, um, I just walked down the halls here in the hospital and seeing all of that adaptive equipment. And oftentimes that's a barrier for someone to get into athletics. So at Dare to Try, we provide all that expensive adaptive equipment, the coaching, the training, and just the joy on someone's face when they get to the finish line of a triathlon, something that they never thought they would do, to them, that finish line is often just the beginning of the rest of what they can do. So I want to stop briefly and just share with you a few things that, that, that I've learned before I conclude. And again, the hope is that you take these with you. You leave here today and you think about them. The first is the power of, of a team. There are so many teams in, in these walls here. And I've been fortunate enough to experience teamwork in all aspects of my life. In the military, teamwork resonates in everything that we did. And nothing says that truer than on April 13th, 2004, my teammate, my soldier, saved my life. We all need a team of people, now more than ever. Days can be hard. We know that. We've all made it through COVID, but that, that was hard. You need people that you can lean on. You need people that you can call when days are hard. But you also need those people you can call when days are good and to celebrate because they can be so good. So find your team of people, lean on each other, rely on them because we're all trying to do this together. I've also realized that we don't give ourselves enough credit on the things that we are capable of doing. If you would have told me 20 years ago, like, hey, Melissa, like you're going to go to a war, you're going to lose a leg, but guess what? You're going to be okay. I would have thought, what are you talking about? Um, but but I, I, I am. And here I am sharing my, my story, but I never would have found any potential that I have. For me, the, the catalyst was, was losing a leg, to kind of reach into the pocket, find that potential that was always there. I just had to, had to find it. So how do all of you like skip the roadside bomb part and find your own potential? Well, well you start by believing that you can. When you come up on, a, on an instance, you're like, oh, there's no way I'm, I can do that. You turn it around that positivity and say, actually, I can do blank. And you fill that blank in with, with whatever it is you're trying to do. So in 2016, um, it was my second Paralympic Games. I had my, my first child, whose name is Dallas. He'll be, he's eight years old. And I had my son Dallas and was trying to get back into peak athletic shape to qualify for my second Paralympic Games in the sport of triathlon. Another long shot to make the team, but I qualified for Rio de Janeiro in 2016. And if any day that my race could have taken place over in Rio at the Paralympic Games, the day was September 11th. So you can imagine the meeting there. 
So waking up in Rio, September 11th of 2016, putting on that USA uniform, knowing that every swim stroke, every bike pedal, every run step, it wasn't just for me. It was for those that no longer could. And swimming, biking, and running up and down the streets of Copacabana Beach in Rio, coming across the finish line, I got a bronze medal that felt like a personal gold. On this amazing day, because my teammates got gold and silver, it was a USA sweep on September 11th. I still get chills thinking about it. And we got to stand on a podium, see not one, not two, but three American flags go up as we heard our national anthem. I got... <laughs> Thinking about that day, how, you know, someone over in Iraq tried to take my life and they didn't. They took my leg, but not my spirit. Truly showing the world the power of the American spirit and how much ability is in a disability. And going home that evening, just so proud of where I was and hugging my husband and my dad with just tears of joy. And then... So trying to make this Rio Paralympic team a reality. And then a few years ago out in Colorado, again, we don't give our, ourselves enough credit on the things that we can do. And trying again, and this time opening, uh, my husband and I opened our own company in Colorado Springs, an orthotic and prosthetic company um, a month before COVID had hit, didn't plan that too well. But, um, and, but again, not knowing what it's going to be, it's scary starting your own company, but Two and a half years later, we, have, we are a thriving business and have helped dozens and dozens of patients kind of resume their normal life. So just back to that never knowing what you can do until you try. And talk about continuing that theme. Um, Kent mentioned up here that a year ago um, I had broken my back. So it was actually two years ago now, now that I think about it. So the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games um, was my, 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 my third Paralympic Games. And um, it was the games of COVID and another theme, long shot to make the team. I made the team, but a month before I was on this blue carpet, I was in a biking accident and um, actually right here on the White Plains River Trail, I flew off my bike, I hit a tree and I fractured my back. And the doctors kept telling me, that's how I feel about that. <laughs> the doctors kept telling me it was the best place to break a back, which is words you never think you're going to hear a doctor say. But I didn't need surgery. I just had to rest. But I had this race I'd been training five years for in a month. So changing that perception, um, I wasn't able to run until the week of the race. And um, But taking that moment, I can tell you I was the happiest fifth place finisher in Tokyo, truly just living in the moment. Too often we get too caught up in what happened yesterday, what happened tomorrow, but just choosing to live in the moment. And I was just so proud and just so happy to be there. So this picture is of me of my lowest of lows. Um, hours after I lost my leg in that Baghdad emergency room, the T on my forehead stands for tourniquet. So if anybody were to find me, they knew that I was had been severely wounded. When I look at this picture now, though, that T on my forehead, it doesn't stand for tourniquet anymore. When I look at it now, to me, it stands for, for turning point, because this was the turning point in my life. We all have them. Maybe you can point it out. Maybe it hasn't happened yet. But we all have these moments that you look back and you realize that this is the day that, that changed who you were. This is the day that I realized that we can't stop the things that come into our lives. I couldn't stop the fact that a roadside bomb hit my vehicle. And I don't think if anyone would have doubted me if I said, oh, woe is me, I lost a leg. But instead it was, well, all I lost is a leg. Now let's get back to living. And I truly hope none of you ever encounter a, a, a true roadside bomb, but there's metaphoric roadside bombs all around us. COVID was one of them, you know, loss of a loved one, divorce, things that you can't often control. But what I've learned is that we all have the power to get through them. You can choose to wake up every morning. To, you can choose to find the good because I promise you there is some good. We can't change what happens to us, but we can change how we perceive it, how the outcome is, and how we choose to get through it. So the next time any of you are in a, in a situation that doesn't go as planned, which will happen, could happen as you walk out of this room, but how are you going to handle it? How are all of you going to rise up, rise up 
to live the lives that all of you want to live. So my life, while well, I'm continuing to train for the Paris 2024 Paralympic Games in hopes of my fourth Paralympic Games and showing that a mom of two can still hang with those younger folks, continuing to try to be the best mom I can be, I feel like I'll take all the advice I can get, and continuing to share my story in hopes that it shows others that you truly can be whoever it is that you want to be. So thank you for having me here today. Thank you to our family foods, to Spartan Nash. This is incredible. And um, hopefully I'll get to chat with all of you after. But if you'd like to follow along on my personal journey, um, I hope that you do. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.